Hello and welcome to episode 58 of Linux Downtime. I'm Joe. I'm Hayden. I'm Gary. Good to talk to you both again. No Martin this time, he's off on assignment, so it's just the three of us. But today, I want to talk about the future. I want to get your opinions on where we're going with all of this. Because I was thinking about the past and how social media came along and solved the problem of forums. And it solved that problem by giving everyone mod status. You can block people, you can mute them. You're basically the moderator of your own social media experience. YouTube, that solved the problem of sharing video. Before YouTube, it was a nightmare. You had to upload it somewhere, you had to encode it with real player and all sorts of stuff. It was just, it was horrendous. TikTok and Vine solved the problem that people don't want to turn their phones on the side or pay attention to one thing for more than a few seconds. And I was just thinking about how technology has evolved by solving these problems. And Linux and open source has always kind of been the foundation of that. If you look at social media, it's all built on top of Linux and open source. So I wanted to get your take on where we're going in the next 10 years. What problems that we're currently facing are going to be solved? And I would imagine that Linux and open source is going to be the bedrock of it all. But is it going to be in the background like that? Or are we ever going to get some sort of Linux and open source at the forefront of these technological innovations that solve problems? So the biggest example of disruptive open source in the market today is AIML. And I come at this admittedly from an open source upstream AI project where I lead the community. And what I see is open source has dramatically accelerated the progress of AIML, literally in the past few months. Let's take, for example, GPT-3. It's a human language model, very modern, very human-like, open source. It took about 10 months to develop. Right now, AI-generated art is all the rage. If you're on social media, you've probably seen it. There's lots of websites that have it. Even Microsoft is building it in to its new office suite. So you can AI generate custom graphics for your PowerPoint with Bing. Yeah, AI is the new clip art, I heard someone say. Yeah. So uh, let's take, for example, Dreambooth. So Dreambooth was a text image model. It was released on August 26th of this year. Stable Diffusion, which is probably the most popular port, was released September 7th, open source. At the time, it required 48 gigabytes of RAM. Within about three weeks, it had video support and only required 24 gigabytes of RAM. By the next day, it had been optimized to only require 18 gigabytes of RAM. And today you can run it with under 10 gigabytes of RAM on your phone. (laughs) And we look at these AI toolkits PyTorch, TensorFlow, PyTorch is really the most prominent one, which was most widely adopted. And these are Linux at the core and arguably Kubernetes at the deployment and management layer. The next huge push around open source to me seems to be AIML. That's where it seems to be most disruptive. And I think going forward, The inclusion of AIML in applications is going to set certain applications apart. And I think open source developers are going to have to start learning a little bit about AIML to include these in their experiences on their applications on things like desktop Linux, open source applications for other platforms. And, you know, if if you manage to avoid Kubernetes, you might not be able to avoid AIML. (laughs) What specifically are open source developers going to have to include to stay relevant? I think, for example, what could potentially get added as a plugin in Pigeon and other desktop Linux applications, things that do text prediction, optimizing what applications you're going to want at specific times, inferencing, say, for example, the ability to identify objects or people in GNOME Photos. In terms of the Linux desktop experience, that's where I see AIML making a big difference. Now, I'm going to break a rule here. Normally, I don't talk about the video that is in front of me, but we are on a video call here. And Gary's face when you suggested that stuff in Pigeon 
grimacing is all I can say. You ever hear people praise autocorrect? Even word suggestion, it's gotten better over time, but it, it messes stuff up. But the bigger issue is, and again, you hear me harp on this all the time, is privacy, 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 privacy. For us to add AIML into Pigeon to do word suggestion, whatever, right? We have to read through all your logs and then build a data model against that. And not everybody's going to be comfortable with that. And obviously, yeah, we can make an option or something like that. But it's just, is that really the future we want? Is that the future we need? Wouldn't something better be like voice to text where like people can just talk and they, they, you know, then we have an AI that's learned their voice enough that it can write the text for them. That seems like a better application to me than trying to do text prediction. That's a valid concern. And speech to text is another great use of AIML. I also think the hardware here is going to solve some of these concerns. So encrypting that personal language model with a key from a secure enclave built into the device, and then optimizing the AIML workloads with the inclusion of NPU devices, which offload those algorithms to dedicated chips that use less power. So as the hardware catches up, and I tweeted about this earlier, but there are now $70, $80 SBCs with dedicated NPUs already. So they are percolating through the ecosystem, including things like encrypted secure enclaves. So I think the hardware is going to solve some of those concerns. But does it though? I haven't kept completely updated on this, but Last time I checked, there weren't any open source secure enclaves. So again, with the privacy factor, you want people to trust a secure enclave that they can't trust because they can't audit the code. So now we're we're still caught in this catch-22 is the problem. There's also the catch-22 of the whole AI ML thing being based on training models that are incredibly hard to open source, even if the software that is used to build the models is open source. It's incredibly hard to replicate that build process. And there's this this huge kind of black box element to AI ML, which means that it's sort of fundamentally different from open source. Like you can't fully expect it to be reproducible and an open source in the sense that we know it right now. Right. I'd also argue that we just recently got to the point where we were able to create reproducible builds for software in general. Yeah. And we are nowhere near that for AI ML. People have problems even proving that their models aren't biased because they can't necessarily provide all the input they used. And then you have to worry about the bias that's in the AI as well. Yeah. And as I've gone deeper into AI ML and specifically deep learning within ML, I hear about this black box and I'm like, there's, there's got to be a way to understand what happens in this black box. And surprisingly, sometimes it is quite a black box, you know, once you get into those really esoteric deep learning models. So it's not reproducible in the same way. But the tooling around AIML has all been open source and has dramatically accelerated the adoption of AIML. And there are issues, of course, with deploying ML in open source software that Gary raised like privacy and how we encrypt that data. And we have open questions about bias and data sets and the models and ethics around AI ML, you know, in the source of data. But when we think about the future and where open source is going to have a big impact, AI is been one in much the same way Linux itself has had a huge impact on what powers our devices, everything from IoT to our workstations. In the same way, Kubernetes, however we feel about it or not, has had a massive impact on managing workloads across, you know, on-prem and hybrid and cloud. AI, it's going to be a killer feature of open source. But in the same way that social media was built on top of Linux and open source, but itself wasn't, Are we not in danger of history repeating itself and that you'll have a bunch of these closed AI ML models that are all built on this open source software foundation, but that again will just sit in the background and be almost taken advantage of 
by the companies that are making their proprietary stuff on top of it? Most AIML, yes, the toolkits themselves are open source, but the most rapidly adopted AIML models are open source and easily forked and iterated on, like the example, Stable Diffusion, Hugging Face, and others. There certainly are proprietary models, and there are proprietary AI tools out there. But when it comes down to how they're implemented, I don't see the same risk necessarily. What about the next generation of young people who want to get away from all this tech and feel that it's dystopian and watch movies that we watched when we were young and realize that, no, this is not the future that we want? Is it possible that that's where open source could shine? I'm not saying this is going to be the majority of people, but there could be a sizable community of people who are now young kids, and by the time they get to our age, are just done with all of this stuff that we've been talking about and will want to be almost tech-free. It won't be possible to be totally tech-free, but open source will be the salvation for those people. That could be the ultimate problem that needs to be solved and that open source can be front and center in solving is that they'll be in total control of everything in their lives and they won't have to be dictated to by AI and the huge companies that are in control of those AI systems. Am I just dreaming thinking that that's a possibility? We're kind of already there. Open source does give you that control, assuming you have the skills to use that control. And there's nothing today saying you have to use AI for things, right? So like, I very purposely don't use any of the assistants or smart speakers just because There's not enough of a benefit to it for me. Yeah, same. It's like, oh, I can set a timer easily. I can just as easily go to Google and type in five-minute timer, and then they don't need to have my voice in their learning models and everything. (laughs) But the the, the problem here is if you're looking at people that are like trying to go, I I don't want to say off the grid, but, you know, low tech. Yeah. Not super high tech. To be able to utilize open source that level, they still have to know how to program and how everything comes together. And that's going to raise the bar significantly for what they need to know. Do they, though? Do they really need to know how to program and how it all goes together? Well, sure, they can go ahead and use existing stuff. But what happens when one of the tools they're using decides to use AI ML or something that they don't want to use? Now they have to figure out how to turn it off, or they beg the developer for an option to turn it off. But the point that I'm making is that there will be people like you out there. There'll be developers who don't want any of this shit, quite frankly, and they they want to be in control of stuff and help other people. And I'm talking about a community here. I'm not talking about just individuals wanting to do it. I'm talking about a community will come together and just be the underground eating rats people from Demolition Man. Yeah, and open source has always been a refuge for reactionaries. The (laughs) DevOn community is out there building system D free Linux, and it works great. So open source will provide options for people who want to opt out. For makers, for hobbyists, for Luddites who still want to use technology but not be plugged into the grid, it will be there. But open source will play just as much a role in what they're trying to get away from too. Open source is one. Proprietary is now the other. Well, proprietary is the layer on top or the layer that's in front, let's say. And open source is everything from that layer down to the bottom or back to the back, whichever way you want to look at it. You look at something like Twitter or Facebook, that front end is all proprietary. We have no idea. And the the algorithms that produce your timeline are all proprietary, but the whole back end of it is all running on Linux and open source software. Hey, hasn't Elon Musk promised to open source the Twitter algorithm? (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's going to go really well. (laughs) We'll just find out the algorithm is just a giant nested if, and that's that's all it's going (laughs) to (laughs) be. Well, I don't think it would necessarily be possible to open source these algorithms because no one understands them. Look at YouTube recommendation algorithm. Are you telling me that a single person or even a group of people over at Google or YouTube understand how that thing really works? It's almost sentient at this point, I would imagine. It's probably a very, very complicated model with hundreds of weights. Yeah, and they can probably influence it to some extent, but I don't think they have full control over it anymore. I don't think they have for a long time. No, they probably don't. 
And it's that dystopian future or present, whichever way you want to look at it, that I think people will want to get away from. Not everyone. It'll be a minority of people, I think. And um, like you said, open source will be part of either side, but it kind of is at the moment. There's people who despise Facebook, Twitter, Google, Amazon. And how do they get away from these companies that are using open source to be the things that they're getting away from? They use something like Debian or Triscoll or whatever, and exclusively free software. They're generally going to call it free software rather than open source if they're those people. Well, this is a place where those free software advocates could potentially jump in and help transform the way AIML has done. One of my criticisms of the Free Software Foundation is that it has always been reactive to trends and technology, while the GPL was an amazing breakthrough. It seems like since then, they haven't quite been on top of things like AML and have just been more critical rather than engaging, where perhaps we need a free software AIML organization or effort or new license for these models that provides reproducibility and provides transparency. More to that point, I think the underlying thing we're missing there is the free software advocates, because I don't want to tie this up with just the Free Software Foundation, because like I'm a free software believer, but I'm not part of the Free Software Foundation, right? So I just want to make that clear. One of the issues is, as you kind of alluded to earlier, was a lot of business is built on open source because they can leverage it and then they fund that open source. They don't do that with free software because the license basically prohibits them from that. So then free software ends up in this state of we're protecting the liberties of everybody and the software, but we have low support from developers because there's no money in it and companies won't give us money because they're not using our stuff. So like there's there's no way to get past that unless you find, you know, somebody who's really into philanthropy and just like here you go. <laughs> But it, like in the meantime, the, the, the deck is stacked against free software when it comes to free software and open source. So by trying to say that like, oh, well, free software should just do this, it's, it, it's kind of glossing over the entire point of there's a huge funding problem here, which we've talked about again and again. But, you know, it's just it's that whole paradigm, right? We, the, how do you solve that? You can't build a competitor to something when you don't have the resources to build the competitor. Well, do let us know what your vision of the future is and where open source and Linux fits into all of that. You can email us, show at linuxdowntime.com. But we'd better get out of here then. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Hayden. I've been Gary. See you later.